It's a November 2nd, 2021, beautiful villages of the, in Florida. My name is Jong Woo Han. I am the president of Korean World Legacy Foundation, which has about more than 1,500 interviews, not only from the United States, but also other 21 countries that participate in the Korean War. We are doing this especially for the commemoration of the breakout of the Korean War, the 70th anniversary, supported by the Ministry of Patriots and Veterans Affairs, MPVA. But fundamental reason that we are doing this interview in your chapter, you are the chapter president, is because we want to preserve their memory because it's been a long time and we want to honor their service. At the same time, it's very important for us to educate about the legacy of the Korean War to our future generation. And I know that you have so much stories to tell me about it because you are the one who are architect of the Tell America program in this chapter. So yes. it is my great honor and, and pleasure to meet you, sir. And I sincerely thank you for everything that you have arranged for this series of interviews in your chapter. We'll go talking about that too later. But thank you again. You are the general, right? I am the man. So you are the major general. Yes. Yes. So I want to thank you, sir. And would you please introduce yourself? What is your name and spell it for the audience, please? I am John Robert McWaters. I mm -hmm. spell John, J-O-H-N, mm -hmm. Robert, R-O-B-E-R-T, yeah. McWaters, M, small c, W-A-T-E-R-S. Mm -hmm. Yep. I was and born in Perry, Georgia. P-E-R-R-Y, -E -E a small community of some 3,000. And what is your birthday? January 21st, 1934. 34, so that makes you 87? Yes. And you, tell, you told me that you are biking and you are... Yes, I bicycle uh, typically. I bicycle five to six times per day. Typically, I bicycle 20 to 25 miles. Whoa, you kid, you're not kidding me. I'm not kidding you. I know I'm so little old to be doing that. Uh, then during the summertime, mm -hmm. when it's quite warm here in Florida, yeah. I typically bike from 5A to 7A because it's quieter, it's dark, and it's cool, and I'm well illuminated. <laughs> <laughs> so you are really energetic, yes, General. I am energetic. Do you do other sports? Well, I've, been, I've done golf yeah. uh, for a long time. I've become somewhat bored with it because it takes so long to time you get there and the time you play 18 holes and then everybody wants to stop for uh, some sort of a libation exactly. at the 19th hole. Yeah. And by the time you get home, the, the day's pretty much used up. Yeah. So uh, I then left that and became involved in a game called pickleball, uh -huh. which is very popular here. Uh -huh. So I had to learn that. What is that? It's a game played somewhat like tennis, mm -hmm. except it's played with a hard paddle and it's played with a whiffle ball, yeah. uh, a white plastic ball with many, many holes in it. Mm. And it's a very popular sport in California and here and it's growing like a weed. I think I need to learn. Oh, it's a wonderful game. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. So. Now you are the president of this chapter, right? Yes. What is the official name of the chapter? It is, uh, the, the official name of the chapter is Korean chapter, one, six, chapter 169 of the Villages, Florida. The Villages, Florida. How many chapter members do you have? 247. 200, that's a, quite a lot. It's the largest chapter in Florida. It's in the Florida. largest chapter in the United States. Also in the USA? Yes. It was not that way when I became the commander. So yeah. how did you recruit all of this? Well, I had uh, some very capable help that I recruited first. Mm -hmm. Who was and, that? And, and once they were on board, and our, our objective, they had 42 members, and we were not in the top 20 in the, on the, 
and the national scene. And I said, look guys, we're going to get organized and we're going to get this thing done. Uh, so, uh, in 2019, two years ago, I suggested that we get together and have a series of breakfasts that we, the Chapter 169, paid for. Mm -hmm. we, we offered that as come, come and socialize with us. You are a smart man. And so uh, we selected a restaurant that was very close to where we hold our m monthly meetings, mm -hmm. and it was called Bob Evans. Mm. So uh, we went and made up with the newspaper, and there's a fellow there who's no longer there, unfortunately, his health got bad. His name is Frank Ross, he and I became dear friends. And he said, well, General, I'll tell you what, I will put it in the paper, mm. in the paper, telling everyone they can come to Bob Evans and have a free breakfast. Mm -hmm. And so it was such a, more, a success that first time, I just scheduled another one two weeks later. <laughs> and again, I asked Frank Ross, Frank, put it in the paper again. And he said, do you want me to just say the same thing? I said, oh, no, no, no. He, so this time he says, General McWaters and the Chapter 169 are reaching out mm -hmm. to all veterans of the Korean War. So we did the second time. Yeah. Long story short, we did five breakfasts in November and early December. Henry had, we served 165 free breakfasts. <laughs> and of that 165, 160, 100, uh, of that 165, 135 paid the money, joined the chapter. So you actually made the profit out of it. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, and so, so my 40-member chapter is now the largest chapter in Florida wow. and the largest chapter in the U.S. So and you that, have a big influence. Yeah, in the... and Joe, listen, I, I was on the map. And the, the National Association said, would you like to be in charge of membership recruiting mm -hmm. at, the, at a national level? And I said, why not? And they said, well, yeah, we want to put you on the board of directors, but you have to run for office and, and get elected. Mm -hmm. So we can't just appoint you. I said, that's all right. Mm -hmm. And so I ran for office, and uh, uh, there were four other candidates, and I defeated all of them, and I became the uh, national director for membership. That was my, uh, my, my committee, and I was the committee chair. And so... We went forward. You have to run for president. Uh, well, uh, we, we've had uh, a lot of, uh, I have a lot of friends uh, that are all, also on the board of directors. There are nine members of the board of directors. Yeah. And there are uh, five, five officers. Uh, all these five, not nine, uh, plus uh, one other, Fif fifteen people can vote. Uh, so I, I beat the other four pretty handily. Mm -hmm. And I became the director. That was back in 2019. And so now, uh, this, de this coming month, December 15th, we have published the call for elections. All of us that are currently serving yeah. and who might like a sort of second three-year term, just reapply and we'll see if we can get you another three-year term. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. <laughs> I want to be the president. Yep. They said, well, go ahead and fill out the application, submit your DD-214, and an autographed picture of your mother-in-law, and assorted a other <laughs> pair. And so that's what my job is. For, uh, after, after you leave, Ron Hoon, uh, I'm going to work on that for a week. Good for you. Yeah, so I can submit it by the... No, I'm talking about national chapter. Yes, I'm talking about being the president of this whole organization, all 165 chapters. In the U.S.? In the U.S. Excellent. So. Excellent. But I haven't won yet. I want to have a Korean War veteran to be the president of KWVA, not the Korea defense veteran yet. No. You are still very young. I'm... I'm, <laughs> I'm You're still biking. I'm still biking. So you got to be a president. And I'm still standing up in front of a bunch of guys that I really love. And they said, what's the pre what is the general going to order us to do yep. for the next two weeks or the next two months?
or whatever. So when you become elected as president, I'll be there, okay, to serve you. Ah, wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Now, I won't take office now until July 1. Right. Because we're on a fiscal year. Yeah. So. So. And I won't know until probably April or May. Yeah. Who won. But. But you'll be one of the ones I call. Please. Uh, <laughs> so, General. Yes. Yes. You called me and talked about Tell America program that you were, you've been working on. I and that, you, yes. you want to make a video program for students. So tell me about those things. Well, okay. Look uh, at the camera, please. All right, I'm looking at the camera. Yep. And the situation was back in 2017, mm -hmm. uh, when I became president of this chapter. Yep. I became a member in 2015. And uh, it took me a, a year and a half or so to kind of look around and I decided, you know, this, 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 this chapter needs leadership, and I am a leadership person. Yep. So, uh, so therefore, uh, I, I felt like this program that we had called Tell America. And the idea of Tell America is to go out at the high school level here in Central Florida and teach people about young men now, and ladies and girls about the Korean War and how I felt about the Korean War having been engaged in it for three years, mm -hmm. some, some time back. So uh, I, I looked at, to see what we had in the way of teaching aids. And we had a small map, yay big, I don't know, two feet by three feet maybe, and it was full of advertisements for McDonald's hamburgers <laughs> and, and uh, Al's Fish House and, and, and showed these places prominently on this map. Oh, yeah. I mean, it only showed South Korea. <laughs> I said, I think the war probably involved both Koreas. So I went about, first of all, get a big map. And I called National Geographic. Mm -hmm. And they said, a General, what do you really want to use this map for? And I told them straight out, I'm going to educate young people in the 11th and 12th grades in Central Florida. Right now, I have, in my program, one high school. Mm. One. As in O-N-E, one. <laughs> and I'm not happy with one. Mm. So first, we have to go out and get some other high schools. But you cannot sell from an empty wagon. I had no map. Mm -hmm. National Geographic said, we have a big map. Five feet by six feet. Mm. And it shows both North and South Korea. Yep. And it's shows the villages and the towns. And I looked at it and I said, God, I was there. I pointed at the map. I said, oh, I was over here. Hmm. But that was, that was 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Hmm. But I could remember some of the town. Hung Nam, where we had to get our fannies out of the frozen chosen at their, what was that name of that town? Hagaruri. Hagaruri, yes. And that's where the, uh, the corps commander was. And the Corps commander was a tall Marine Lieutenant General. And I'm not a Marine. I'm, I'm GI. I'm right. a soldier. Yeah. Uh, but they were having a terrible time uh, with, a, with uh, busting up rock so that they could smooth this area out and the highway could continue on around a big cliff. Right. And they didn't have a big cliff. I mean, they didn't have any jackhammers. You've yeah. seen jackhammers, mm -hmm. all right? Well, I was in a combat engineer battalion, and we had jackhammers. And I went to the battalion commander, I said, they are having a bit terrible problem up so there. So you were in the Hegeruli there? I was, I was back in Hung, I was way down in Hung Nan. Yeah. 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 And, and we were talking about, we're going to have to get out of here, because things are not looking good. Mm -hmm. Well, they said, we've got a request here from this, this Marine general yeah. that he needs some help busting up some rock. And he'd say, ask us if we had any jackhammers. Uh, now, Corporal, this is the battalion commander speaking to me. And I'm thinking, he should know how many jackhammers he, he <laughs> owns in this battalion. <laughs> because they were all in the, what they call the support platoon of headquarters company. And I'm in the support platoon. And so we, we wired back to the general and said, we have four jackhammers and an air compressor truck mounted. 
and we can drive it up there to you. And, and he was ecstatic. Mm -hmm. Send them on. I had a really good driver, but he was terrified of jackhammers. What was your rank at the time? I was a corporal. Corporal? Yes. Yeah. The lowest non-commissioned officer. Right. But there's a key word there now, commission. Right. Boy, <laughs> that, that, and even today, 50 years later, 60 years later, that was still one of my big promotions. Going from private to corporal, ha ta ta ta. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I drove. Actually, I rode because this kid I got as a driver to win. And we're got the, the, the air compressor is a huge thing. And it's cold as a mischief. And it's a diesel run. And it's a bitch to start it. It had a little pony engine on it, gasoline engine. And once you could get it running, you could put it in gear, and that would start this monster of a 210 Leroy air compressor, 210 cubic feet per minute. Mm. Okay, now mm. you with me? Yep. Okay, so we drive up to Haguri, yep. and, I, and, and I said, I'm, my orders are for me to report to General Oliver Prince Smith, U.S. Marine Corps. Oliver Smith. I had, I had it yes. memorized. Yep. It's important to remember people's names. And so they, that's him right over there. Hey, Corporal, there he is. He's that tall fella. So I went over and reported. He said, Sonny boy, did, did you bring me an air compressor? Yes, General, I did. Do you know how to You really did it? Yes. And, and he said, do you know how to operate that thing? Uh-huh. Yes, sir, I do. I'm highly skilled with, a, with that air compressor. And he said, you're not really kidding me, are you? I said, all I need is some of your able-bodied Marines, maybe four or five of them, to help me get all that stuff out of the trailer. Mm -hmm. You see, see that dump truck there? The dump truck's got the air compressor in it, and it's in there permanently. We well, don't, don't go take it out. It stays there. You see that trailer? All the tools are in there. Chainsaws, jackhammers, uh, all kinds of equipment. That's, I'll use what I need. I will supervise. And, and you know, he just looked up and said, thank you, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> you are telling me the real story. This is the story. Excellent. And so we went busy. We, we started breaking up that boulders and one thing and then another. And see, we left early in the morning yep. to get there in two hours. And we were breaking up the rock and we were really working at it. And he, the, uh, the general came out and blew his whistle and said, Sonny, he looked at me, said, load all your stuff up. We've got to get the hell out of here. I mean, like now. And you and your driver take that right back down to Hung Nan. Mm -hmm. and I said, but I wanted to be able to tell everybody that I was at Frozen Chosen. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he said, you can tell them, we're in about six hours. <laughs> but that's, that'll, It'll be a good story for you, sonny boy. So you went up to the Chosen I, from that's there? Where I, that's where Haguri was. Yeah, that right. Was, that was the, uh, what did he call it? That was 10th Corps. He was a 10th Corps commander. Yeah. Commander. Mm -hmm. Commanding general. Mm -hmm. And he said, and, and I, by then I had six Marines out there working. And when the general said, we're, we're halt, we're, we're getting out of here. Mm -hmm. And the Marines called it, they called it the Great Bug Out. Yeah. Seriously, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. So I just got all that stuff back in the trailer, and the kids still driving the truck, and we started driving back to Hangnan. Hangnan. H U N. Yeah, Hangnan. H U N. Support. Yes. Support. Yep. And they were bringing ships to evacuate. But the, what they, they were evacuating more Korean people uh, from because they're leaving their homes and their villages, and, and uh, I think all of them, not all of them, but most of them were getting on one ship, uh, by the thousands. Can't think of the name of the ship. Meredith. Meredith. Liberty Meredith. Yep. Good for you, golly! <laughs> you realize how long ago that was? <laughs> that, that, that December day. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. So you remember all those. Can you take off your and uh, glass? Yes. Because it uh, has a... Yes. All Is right. that better? Yeah. All right. All right. So, so, so there we were on that same road, mm -hmm. driving all the way back 
mm. where we had just come that morning in the dark. Yes. In the dark. And uh, so we had this kid, he said, Corporal, uh, you, are you, you sure this is what we're supposed to be doing? <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm afraid it is. That, well, that was that ship's name. Mary. And so you remember in, you were in that ship too? No, no. We, we were, uh, some, of the, the, some of our people yeah. were on the ship because they were the, what we call the walking wounded. Yeah. Uh, but those of us that were able-bodied and could drive anything that had wheels. Mm. For example, I drove a rubber-tired backhoe, yeah. a backhoe, uh, all the way down. Let's say we left Hung Nan. We drove down like we were going all the way back to Pusan, but we didn't go that far. We did. We went pretty good ways, though. Wow. We did. I, so you didn't take a ship, but you drove down from Hunan. I drove Hunan. on the coast highway. Yeah. Coast highway. A number of little. See, I, what I should have done mm. is brought my map. Yeah. And I could have sat here and pointed at things, but you would. You're a Korean. You would know exactly where these places are. Yeah. I would hope. You yeah. Know. Yes. I can. I, you yeah. don't. But you don't go to North Korea much, do you? No. No. I wouldn't think so. No. So. The, we were talking about the Tell America program, oh, yes, and I, so you I'm wanted to tell these things to the school. Yes. And you called me to work together with my foundation, right? Yeah, yes. yes. So today I watched a video. Oh, yes. Yeah, by Bill McLaughlin and, yes. and Mark Carey, and we decided to work together. They will make a report back to you, and we will, you will decide finally how we're going to go do it, okay? Wonderful. Yes. Yes. Because yes. there was no program. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I'm saying to everybody, uh, I didn't know how to do a PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. I kept hearing, but I didn't know how because I, I didn't have a laptop computer. Right. So I bought one. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I reconditioned one from, uh, from uh, Sandy Fuller. Uh, one of my golf buddies who was retired from Dell, D-E-L-L, -L, they manufacture yeah, yeah. laptops, Dell all laptops. kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so I said, uh, I told Sandy what I needed. He said, uh, I can teach you how to do a PowerPoint presentation, Good. but I cannot be there and hold your hand. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, seriously. Uh, so we'll start out, and I'm going to find you a reconditioned laptop mm -hmm. that I will warrant because I'm retired from Dell yep. and I'm not going to let him mess you up. Mm. So he did and he, and he lives four doors down the street from me and so he would start me out. Do you see this button? That's, that's, it, that's how you turn it on and we're going to go from there. Okay. And I made progress but I learned I had to write it down and and then he said, well, how are we going to do this thing to teach these kids? I said, well, I brought, like a, I brought back home some pictures that I took, photos, uh, with the, with the uh, camera that belonged to the platoon. It's US Ar it was U.S. Army. You should have brought that picture today to me. I, I, now, I now own a laptop. Mm -hmm. And I have some uh, photos that I brought back with me uh, from Korea. And, uh, and with Sonny Fuller's help, Sandy Fuller's help, uh, we started making some slides and getting them in there in the wrong order, of course, the first time around. Uh, and then I, went, I started looking for slides uh, through uh, Google. Uh, I just, I just, I want to Google uh, a slide of a, of a reinforced timber bunker uh, mm -hmm. that the battalion commander could hide in. Yeah. Uh, that type thing. Uh, uh, and slowly but surely over the course of a year, mm -hmm. I had a, a PowerPoint presentation that I could t t set it up in front of any class yep. and I could talk them through it. Mm -hmm. So I, I learned that in the high schools, they have something called Junior ROTC. And these are young, young men and women, boys and girls, that are involved in what is known as the Junior ROTC program. Yes. And one day per week, they're in uniform. And so I said to the principal of the school, if you will allow me, I will be happy to teach 
all of your ROTC classes on that Wednesday when they're in uniform. And he said, General, you're on, but you're going to be worn out at the end of the day. That's too many. I said, well, okay, I'll compromise. I'll, I'll, first time out, I'll do three. You know what he said? Good move. Mm. I'll help you. Mm. That's when I learned that the school, each high school, hired retired Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine people to be on the faculty yeah. and to be in charge of the junior ROTC folks. And they had a lieutenant colonel, retired, and they had a, uh, a master sergeant, retired, mm. on the Army side. And then I, so the next, uh, the next one I went to was Navy, and then after the Navy I went to the Air Force, and it wasn't long, a little, actually it was almost two years before I had six high schools that all the ROTC classes I was teaching uh, all of them. But why is it important for you to do that? Why? It was important for me to do that because I didn't feel anyone was educating them about the war where I had spent a lot of my time as a young man. Uh -huh. And I wanted to tell them that story. What story? The story of the Korean War. Yeah. And plus the fact I could go there in uniform there since you saw me in this morning. White shirt, brass, rank, everything. But why is it for you to tell the story of the Korean War? Why Korean War is important? Yeah, the Korean War is important because it had become known in the press as the Forgotten War. And I thought that was so bad. I said, that's like a report. I said, that's, a, that's an important victory. Because I can assure you, North Korea came out on the short side of that conflict. Yep. I mean, uh, all that up there, uh, that rice bowl, uh, that's this side of the DMZ, belonged to North Korea until when they came across the line there on June the 25th, 1950. But now it belonged to South Korea. Mm -hmm. And I felt like they will never give that back. Right. <laughs> It'll be a cold day in hell before they give that back. And I want to tell that story. Yeah. And I want to show them on the map where that was. But General, why the Korean War has been known as Forgotten War in the, in, but, in the minds of American people? Why? Well, because, that's a, and that, uh, that, that's a, a great question. But I think the reason primarily is we were going through uh, the, uh, the situation with how important TV became to the, uh, the news. I mean, we had Walter Cronkite, and we had Harry Reasoner, and, and, and they were pitching that uh, another way, that mm -hmm. we had wasted a lot of our time, a lot of money, a lot of uh, uh, our blood, uh, and, and for in a forgotten war because we didn't get anything out of it. Mm -hmm. And I thought we, we saved, we saved a, 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 a fine young country uh, that's just now getting off its feet. Uh, and now look how it is. Hot diggity dog. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it was a great pleasure for my wife and I in, two, uh, in 2016 to go on that program uh, tele uh, that was... Uh, revisit program. The program was Career Revisited. Yeah. And paid for, paid for by the government of South Korea. Yeah. And put us up in a five-star hotel in downtown Seoul. Man, oh man, we got off that airplane and it took us by bus, two buses loads, and we got off the bus and we went into the front door and walked through the lobby toward the elevators. And you, you won't believe this, you'll think I'm making this. On each side of us were lined up the staff at that hotel. The most noticeable were the chefs with their white outfits and those tall, funny hats that they mm -hmm. wear. Okay, mm -hmm. and so and they and they and they were clapping, clapping. All walked us all the way to our elevators. They were carrying our luggage. They, they were so glad to see us. How did you like it? I tell you what. That was, so when were you in Korea? When did you arrive in Korea? In the war. In the war, I arrived in Korea in uh, late October, nineteen fifty. Wow, and that, so and, it was in the was, beginning the, of the war. That was the big time, you know, if you, as you recall, we had the breakout down at Pusan on September 15th. Yes. And we had that incredible landing at Incheon that MacArthur pulled out of the Xinjiang. Yeah. Uh, and it worked. 
it worked. Yeah. And he put those two Marine divisions ashore, and we cut the North Koreans off at their knees. They were still, they were still down there at the Pusan perimeter uh, when we had broken out of there. And I don't know. So cut them where off. did you arrive, Pusan or in Incheon? Uh, let's see. <clears throat> I, fl I flew commercial air to uh, Nagasaki Air Force Base, mm -hmm. Japan. Yeah. Japan. Uh, there's several buses there. All, all of us were, you know, recruits. Uh, recruits uh, with our duffel bags and all our, all our gear. And we landed there in Nagasaki. Where? Nagasaki. Nagasaki. Yep. And we got on buses immediately. Yep. And we were driven to the U.S. US Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. Coast Guard. At a place called Sasebo. Sasebo. I think that's right. Yep. And from there, uh, we loaded up this, this, the Coast Guard cutters, they were called. Uh -huh. Cutters. I, I, I can't remember how, how big the crew was, but I would say, I don't know, 60 or 70. And there were a couple of hundred of us. And we sailed across the uh, South China Sea. Would that be right? No, you, you wouldn't go far that way. Go to Korea, right? Yeah, we were going to Pusan. Yeah, Pusan. From, from Sosebo. Yep. And, and it, it was, uh, I don't know, it took about two and a half hours uh, at sea, and it was a rough sea. Mm -hmm. I'd never been on a, a ship before. Right. Everybody got a little sick. So anyhow, we, uh, we got off uh, at uh, Pusan, and that's when we were told uh, that everybody that had been at Pusan the month before was gone. They were marching up the coast road and cutting off uh, the North Korean army uh, and taking prisoners. And at the same time, MacArthur's two marine divisions were driving across the peninsula and we're going we're gonna to take a lot of prisoners. Yep. And we did that. And what was your unit? Uh, at what that, division? At, at that time, my order said report to, report to, 7th Infantry Division, had location to be determined. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll move it. Uh, and you will be a member of the 13th Combat Engineer Battalion. Mm -hmm. And so when I got there, uh, back in that time, 1950, we really didn't have computers. Everything was done on a, with a pencil and a paper called a morning report. Mm -hmm. And next thing I knew, they had put me in to... Uh, uh, a, a mounted armor outfit, uh, but that was just temporary. They straightened out my order. The next thing I know, I'm now in a combat engineer battalion, mm -hmm. which I really liked. So what was, was your specialty? That was my specialty. Was I was a rifleman, or what did you do? Uh, well, what I, I what I could do uh, were things that I had learned. Uh, on the farm in mm. Perry, Georgia, yeah. with my two uncles, Uncle Lewis and Uncle Booty, uh, I learned how they installed uh, what's known as uh, uh, a latrine with a, uh, uh, a septic tank. Mm. I learned how, how that was done. Yep. And also I learned to drive a tractor. So remember I told you later I could drive that rubber tire backhoe? It was just like a farm tractor. Mm -hmm. No problem. So I, I learned to do that. Uh, and general engineer work, and and so uh, I met the uh, the platoon leader, and the first thing I noticed on his collar were not engineer Kessels, crossed rifles. Mm -hmm. He was infantry, and he goes, he said, "Now don't stare." <laughs> he said, "Soldier." He was a first lieutenant, first lieutenant, and his name was Will. Hill Tankersley. <laughs> we became friends for life from that day forward. Uh -huh. uh, because next thing I knew, I was his driver. And he's, he said, you don't ever seem to get lost, so <laughs> I'm, I'm going to make, make you my driver. Yep. And, I, and I said, sure, come, not, not a problem, sir, begging your pardon, a first lieutenant. And, and uh, away we went. 
And, and we, did a, uh, we did a lot of things. Uh, the, but from Busan, where did you go? What's that? From Busan, where oh. did you go? Oh, where was I when I met up with the 7th Entry Division and, and the platoon? We were at, right up on the, at that point. See, that was uh, uh, November. We hadn't crossed the 38th parallel. A, okay. lot, of, a lot of the forces had. But we were back doing assorted, uh, we're, we're, first of all, there was a, a bridge uh, over the Han River, uh, right there in Seoul, uh, that had been badly damaged. Yep. And, and the, the, the be, being that this was a, an engineer combat battalion, a lot of equipment, and a lot of guys that could do welding, and so they were doing various repair work. Uh, it wasn't going very fast, uh, but we were getting there. And uh, uh, who was it? The president of South Korea. Sigmund Rhee. Sigmund Rhee yeah. uh, recognized the battalion mm. for, the, for the hard work they were doing. And we got, the whole unit got an award. It's a little red badge. Mm. I've, been still, I've been wearing it today. Anyhow. We did. We we were all kind of hanging out there, uh, and the war was going on up the way. And the next thing I know, we packed up and we went to uh, Pyongyang, mm -hmm. Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea. Mm -hmm. And and it was and we were it was getting shot up pretty good. I mean, we were putting some artillery fire, and that was devastating. And uh, there were there were a lot of fires. Uh, we were. It was. Uh, a tough thing. But anyhow, we kept advancing, kept advancing, and it was getting very, very cold. And the next thing we knew, uh, we were over at, how did, I can't remember how we got over to Hang Now, Hang Nun. We got, but somehow we did. Yeah. I don't remember how. Same way we jumped but did Chinese intervene when you were there in Pyongyang, right? Yes, they did. Yeah. They came across the uh, Yalu River. Yalu River. Yeah. Yes, they did. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to say Thanksgiving time of year. Yeah. Maybe maybe even uh, close to Christmas. Yeah. You know, uh, but they came, and we learned, even the Marines learned, that they had some really good. The Chinese now I'm speaking of. Mm. They had some really good infantry skills. Yeah. And that's when we learned that they had been helping in the civil war that had been going on in China yes. Yes. between Chiang Kai shek's whole forces. Yes. And uh, the, uh, the communist uh, fellow, uh, Chu Enlai, Chu Enlai. Chu Enlai. Yeah. Anyhow, yeah. Uh, these guys that were coming across the Yalu uh, in rubber boats. Silently, silently at night. <laughs> Next thing we knew, there were more of them than there was of us, and that's when that all that mess started happening, at uh, at what we we started calling Frozen Chosen, and that's where, and that's where, General Oliver Prince Smith came into my life, uh, and I drove that truck up there, with that with that. Uh, 210 Leroy air compression on it. Huh. The Chinese, as I say, came into the war yep. and in great numbers and, uh, and were pushing not only us, uh, but all the United Nations forces. Yep. Because we were co-located there uh, with, uh, somehow we became involved with the 1st Battalion of the Colombian National Army from South America. Yes. And they, and oh, I know what it was. They had no engineer battalion. I see. And they requested an engineer battalion, combat battalion, to, to do general engineer tasks for them. Well, they didn't get the whole battalion. They got our, they got our platoon, which was a, a, a support platoon. Uh, to look after their headquarters, and they really, they really only wanted us to to, to build uh, timber bunkers. Mm. So, because in the the, the, the uh, tactical situation was fluid, and everybody was moving either north, south, east, west, uh, and 
They're trying to avoid being captured. Uh, and we were helping those guys out. And somehow, I have to kind of reconstruct this. Uh, somehow we, well, next thing I know, we were below, we were beyond the Han River. We were beyond the, uh, uh, beyond Enchon. Uh, we were beyond, beyond Seoul. We were beyond the Han River. We were beyond the 38th parallel even. And, but somehow, somewhere south of that, uh, we took a stand. The United Nations did. Uh oh, uh, I would say that would be probably spring of, two, of 19, 1950. Yeah, 1951. Yeah. That would be springtime. Yeah. And we, we stopped them. Dead. I mean, stopped them. And then we started moving back, going back north. Yeah. And uh, retracing our steps. And it's, you know, you have to remember the war started in June of 1950. Right. This is now January, six months later, and we've, they've attacked, pushed the UN forces all the way down to Pusan. We break out. We push them all the way up to the Yalu. And then come the Chinese again. come into it, and they push us all the, way, all the way back across the Han. Right. And all the way down to, I, I don't know, I would say we were probably uh, not a hundred miles but south of the 30th parallel. So, yeah, yeah. So, but, but, but we were, we had gone to, we'd, Seoul had fallen again. Uh, so, it, it came to us a halt, and uh, United Nations forces started going back up, and we had a, we had a pre objective that the, the big brass, the big planners, had said was going to be our, our, and it became known as the demilitarized zone. It was a high ground. Yeah. I mean, there were such things on it as Porkchop Hill. Mm -hmm. There were such things on it as Old Baldy and other high ground. So we were always looking downhill at them. And, and so where a, were you then? Where, what where were you? Uh, our, our battalion was basically doing construction work between the, between the 38th parallel and what is now the DMZ. Mm -hmm. That, that, that uh, area in there. Uh, and were you in Kumha Belly or Kumha Belly? Yeah. Where were you? What well, What was your camp name? Oh God! Let's Old Bardi or? Oh, we had we had Camp Riley. Camp we, Riley. Yeah, we were there, and we kind of we, we would be there, and then we'd go out, and then we'd come back. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but at, at that point, the war had stabilized. I mean, it had become, uh, I don't know if this is the right time, a trench warfare type thing. Yep. Reminiscent of World War I. Yes. It, we, and, and we were well dug in. And it was, it's, well, it was springtime. And as we're getting warm, it was nice. Uh, but we were, we were constantly worried about the next winter. I mean, the soldiers, you know, uh, if that suffered through that first winter, uh, so cold. It was so cold. Can you describe how cold it was? Yes, because, well, uh, the, the sleeping bags that we had issued were for, for a mild winter environment. Mm. And we did not have a mild winter. We were below zero almost constantly. And the trouble with it is uh, you get in the sleeping bag, your hot breath, pretty soon you were wet yep. because it condenses against the, it, the inside of the bag. And <laughs> it was a pitiful situation. And, and we, all of us were putting the word out to anybody who would listen. We do not want to, if we've got to stay through the next winter, you're going to lose a lot of people going over the hill. Mm. Uh, it was just, we, we feared it. Honest to God feared another winter like that. And the second winter wasn't quite that bad. Uh, and that helped a lot. And then uh, two other things happened. One, I've spoken to you earlier about Lieutenant Tankersley. Yeah. My platoon leader. Yeah, yeah. And we became his right. friends. He passed away uh, a couple of years ago. Anyhow, uh, like I say, he was an infantry guy. And uh, a West Point graduate. 
Uh, and he said, you know, finally, Mac Waters, my, my, my driver, you, all your paperwork has caught up with us. And now I'm finding out that you not only excelled at boot camp or basic training, but you also went to AIT. A what is Advanced Infantry Training. Okay. And, and you went there because you had volunteered mm. to come into the service. You were not a conscript. You were not somebody that came here at the barrel of a gun. Yep. So here's, here's the deal. Since you were at AIT, you learned to fire a Browning automatic rifle. Yeah. In fact, it says here you're expert with it. Would you agree with that? I said, I'm more than expert. <laughs> I mean, I can put steel on the target, Lieutenant. He said, well, we have, he said, but I, I said to him, Lieutenant, surely you must be aware. This is an engineer platoon. It's not an infantry platoon. Mm -hmm. We are not authorized one of those weapons. He said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Two days later, he says, take my Jeep. Mm. and take, these, take you some help and drive all the way back down to Pusan. My roommate from West Point is running the depot down there and he will give you a BAR and all the ammunition you can steal and take, take your two helpers with you. Mm. So we drove his Jeep all the way down there, found this, other, this lieutenant and he had, a, a, he had taken the BAR out of that big case covered with cosmoline Mm. and cleaned it up, cleaned it up. And, and, and he said, now, go, the range is right over there, soldier, cor corporal. And you and your two buddies, take all the ammunition you want, just go down there and get, get, get familiar with it. And so for the rest of the day, we did. Next day, we drove back. So when we got back, Lieutenant Tankley said, uh, uh, you know, a BAR team is three people. We have a shooter, yep. a loader, yep. and a spotter. Now, I want you to select two guys that you, you train them, and you cross train them. You're the shooter one day, and the guy's the loader. The next day, you make him the shooter. And the guy that's the spotter, you make him the loader. So that you work together, work together. I, boy, I was all over that. So we'll do that. And these two kids were black, and they were from Alabama. And you know, I'm a southern boy from Georgia. No, supposedly, they don't get along with black <laughs> folks. That's wrong. I was raised with them from, from a little kid, you know. And, I, and, and these two were, were sharp young soldiers. Uh, I was at that time 18 years old, and they were like 19 or 20. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, they had... Sometimes the black folks in the South have some strange names. So I just have to tell you what. You're the tallest. I'm going to call you Alpha. And you're the shortest. I'm going to call you Bravo. Mm. So now we've got Alpha, Bravo, and the Corporal. Yep. Okay? And, and they were all over that. And so then what Tankersley wanted us to do, provide security for the work site. Where we're down in the ditch digging holes or whatever, you take the high ground and don't let the Chinese sneak up on us. So the, your enemy was Chinese, not North Korean? North Korean. Uh, we just didn't see them like we saw the Chinese. Because the Chinese, the way they dressed those cotton, yep. funny looking uniforms, mm -hmm. and they, and they blew, the, blew the bugle every time they were going anywhere. Right. Uh, so your enemy was Chinese? Chinese, yep. primarily. Mm -hmm. yep. Sure enough. So, uh, and so uh, then, then you, we realized we're in a stable condition here. We're not going up across the DMZ. We're going to hang on and just keep them from running us off this hill. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we were just doing things to help people. And one day, it came to pass, one day, that we were, uh, remember I told you I was putting, giving support to this uh, battalion from South America. Yeah, Columbia. 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 Yeah. And, the, and the, the, the old man, the commander named Diaz, D-I-A-Z, -D I, I think I got that right. But anyhow, he wanted a timber bunker like he had seen us build for the division headquarters. 
And I, so we said, okay, we will go to, we're going to build you a standard command bunker. Mm. And the only thing you can see out of now, Colonel Diaz, is a little opening like that. And that's going to be facing downhill. Yep. Because you're infantry. You're, you're supposed to engage these Chinese soldiers. Mm. I'm an engineer. I'm supposed to make a nice bunker for you to hide in. And so, and we did. And, and to make it really operable, uh, we rigged him up uh, uh, what, what we call, uh, I'm to think of the right name of it. Uh, mm -hmm. not, an, not an outhouse. Uh, uh, it's not, my mind's just slipping on that. But anyhow, we knew how to do it. And so, and, and we did. Uh, uh, and they came. Next thing I know, one of the villagers, the, the villages at, at that time, young, young who in that part of, uh, we're in that area that's below, above the 38th parallel, below the DMZ. The villages had just been ruined. And many of the villages had dug shallow trenches, shallow trenches into the side of the hill. And, and anyhow, it came to pass that the, that the village chieftain, I can't remember, what's the Korean word for the chief of the village? Chonjang. Say? Chonjang. I, I think I remember that. Yeah. Okay. An older man. Yeah. But he could speak English. Right. Oh. Oh, yes. And in fact, it came to, we've, we learned that most of the villages yeah. that had dug these impossible caves and, 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 and and he said to the other Lieutenant Tankson said, you take care of what he needs. And so he came to me and uh, I said, what, what, how can I help you? He, and he told me about the cave. And he said, what I want you to help me do is get the human waste out of the cave. I mean, that was as simple as he could put it. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you can't keep crapping in the same hole. That's, all right, we, we, we got to have some help. And, I, and he said, I see you put these, uh, you call them latrines, mm. and, and septic tanks. You, know, you run the water into this septic tank, and it makes the doo-doo go away. <laughs> it said, that's a secret that you Americans know. Mm. I said, well, it's also what a lot of us know in Perry, Georgia, because it's about everybody's house has got a septic tank. I mean, there wasn't any big water mains or sewer lines out in the street. Everybody just about had a septic tank. And I knew how to knock a septic tank. Mm -hmm. Because the two uncles, I had helped them a countless times. So I said, okay, where is the well? Let's, let's start with that. Father, body who? And he said, over the hill. I said, how do you get the water into the cave? The, lit, the women carried in the buckets. I said, okay, okay, I got the picture. Well, we had all kinds of building materials. Mm -hmm. Now, in this era, the plastic pipe that you see plumbers using today ha had not come, had not been born. Mm -hmm. So we had either cast iron, no, 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 too, too, not going to work. So we built the septic tank out of treated timbers, ran the water, we dug a trench, shallow trench, made the pipe out of pressure-treated timber so that the water would run down into the cave, into a little pool, can. They had water, and then from the water, it went into the latrine where both man and woman could have a place to sit <laughs> and do their business, as, the, as they called it. And from there, it went into the septic tank. You are genius. And you know how long it took us, a 32-man platoon, to do that? Uh -huh. One day. Just one day? One day. Wow. And, and that, that chief, he could not believe that. Oh. Hey, I said, well, all of us know how to do that. And so, you know, these guys over here know how to put that little trench in there to bring the water from the well down to, into the cave. And that's what they do. These other people know how to build the septic tank itself, which is a two chamber, but it's built with pressure-treated timbers. And, uh, and we've got dump trunk loads of timbers, uh, many as you want, 
they, they were coming up from the port. And so, after we've done one, mm -hmm. well, guess what happens in, in, in Korea mm -hmm. uh, when you've just done one? Mm -hmm. The word gets around like right, right. wildfire. <laughs> and uh, so, the next little Everybody bit, wants it. The next little village we get to, there they are. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think we'd be, uh, in the course of that spring, fall, I guess maybe we probably did two dozen of those. Mm -hmm. Maybe they did. So, during your service, when did you leave Korea? You arrived in uh, late August of uh, 1950. I, I, I got, yeah, uh, we left Korea. The war ended in, uh, in uh, July 27th, and uh, we started uh, starting to get people out. I didn't get out until almost Thanksgiving. You talking about November of 1953? Yes. Why did you stay there long? Because you were promoted? No, no, it was not that at all. It's just that there were so many people that had gotten there ahead of our group, among, uh, that uh, they had longevity or, or whatever, and uh, they, were, they were combat people. They were infantry. Right, but... We were engineers, and, and we were kind of... Well, you guys ought to stay around, and we've got to clean up a lot of things. Blah, blah, blah. So, so the war had been over two months before I got home. My mother was very worried about it. Uh, but anyhow... But you were able to get out of there in one year, right? Three years. No, no, you, I mean, if you wanted, you could come out of there sooner than 53, right? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I could have, but the infantry guys, the armor guys, the artillery guys, they were getting out first, and, uh, and so uh, the rest of us... Uh, so you saying that you were there in three years? Well, I... I, I Yes, I think. You were in Korea for three years? Yes, I, I didn't get there until sometime in October. I didn't get out until sometime in November. So it was three years and a month. Wow. In fact, it shows on my, on my DD-214, three years and 26 days, I think. Wow. Anyhow, anyhow, that's how it happened. And in the meantime, I had a letter from my mother. Mm. My father was deceased. Yeah. Uh, I had a mother and a grandmother uh, and a stupid older sister. Anyhow, <laughs> uh, I got a letter from her. And she said, whenever the army discharges you, please tell them we, do, we don't live in Perry, Georgia anymore. Mm. Uh, we now live in Charlotte, North Carolina. I see. Now, here's where the story gets good. What? Because Lieutenant Tankersley... Early on in our association, said, Mac Waters, Mac Waters, why is it you never went to college? You're very bright. Mm. And I said, well, Lieutenant, it happened that uh, the little high school in Perry, Georgia, that I went to was very small, and it did not offer college algebra. Mm. It did not offer beginning chemistry. And I applied for admission to Georgia Tech and I got a letter from them saying, thank you, but no thanks, mm. because you don't have the prerequisites to attend this fine institution. Mm. Okay. My, and my mother smarted over that. You know, we're citizens of Georgia, we've been paying taxes of both two generations, and they won't even let you go to Georgia Tech. Yeah. Anyhow, so I get now, now, home, uh, and I rode a bus. We flew into Otis Air Force Base in uh, New Jersey. So that's so after you came back from Korea? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, now, I'm now back in the U.S. Yeah. Now I've got to find my new mother's new residence, and it's in Charlotte, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And the Army is putting me on a bus. Mm -hmm. Here, here's your TR, your travel voucher. Okay? I'm on the bus. Yeah. What did I have? My duffel bag? Yes. <laughs> Everything I owned was in that duffel bag. Yeah. You're with me. Yeah. And I get to Charlotte, North Carolina, and we get it, I get out at the bus station. Yeah. I've never been out of Georgia in my life other than to go to Korea. So I know nothing of Charlotte, North Carolina. And so I get off the bus, and they had a little thing there for the USO. And I'm in uniform, you know, and I walk up, and I tell them, here's my mother's address. I said, you got, it's eight blocks down this street right here, eight <laughs> blocks. Want us to get you a cab? I said, no, I can walk eight blocks. 
Well, what are you going to do with the duffel bag? Same thing I've been doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I walked eight blocks, went up there to that address, knocked on the door. Yeah. My grandmother came to the door, mm -hmm. and she turned around and hollered, Robert's home. What? Oh, yeah. I'm a John Robert, and she's a, yeah, yeah, she, yeah. she is. And so, uh, now there's this, now here is the kicker. I go in and we have coffee, we sit around and, and she said, son, I got some news for you. You know, you couldn't get in Georgia Tech mm -hmm. because you didn't have those prerequisites. You didn't have college algebra and you didn't have chemistry, right? Yeah. We're going to fix that tomorrow morning. We're going to fix that. I, I said, where are we going to fix that, mother? She said, well, you, we have an appointment with Mr. John Ott, the principal of the big high school here, Charlotte Central High School, and have told him your story. And he said, bring him in here. I'll see that he gets those two classes. I'll see that he can get in Georgia Tech. So we went down the next morning. He was waiting on us. And guess what? He was a World War II GI, hmm. a sergeant. And we hit it off, right off. And so he said, OK. By then, he had gotten my transcript from Perry High School. Hmm. He said, well, what you did take, you did good in. You made up just about all A's. So we know you, you can read and comprehend. And so what I'm going to do is we have a wonderful instructors in this high school in college algebra and in uh, chemistry. The, the next semester starts January the 3rd. I'm enrolling you. And you're going to learn those two in one semester. <laughs> so come June the 1st, I'm going to give you a degree as a graduate of Charlotte Central High School. And now you've already got one degree from Houston County High School. But what we're going to do, so now sit down here, don't, see I was saying thank you, and I was getting ready to get up. He said, no, 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 no. I'm going to call Mr. Carmichael. He's the registrar at Georgia Tech. There are a lot of students from my high school who go to Georgia Tech. I know him personally. So he just said, you and your mother, just sit down and be calm. He called this guy Carmichael, and they chatted. They just said, yeah, Christmas is coming up, all that kind of talk. And he said, by the way, remember I called you about this GI that, that, that uh, his mother's moved here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he's sitting right in front of me, and he's a decorated GI from Korea. He's, he's wearing wow. a blue CIB. Mm -hmm. So he has been in, he's been on fire, and that's why he's wearing that rifle. Yep. So that's why, so I haven't told you the story about the Battle of Old Baldy, but that was a big thing. And we, and we were on top of the thing with that Colombian, uh, 1st Battalion, and, and the, the Chinese were making it were rough. They were, they were, so what was the name of battle you just mentioned? The Battle of Old Baldy. Yeah. It happened on March 23rd. 1953. Yeah. March 23rd, 1953. And so there I, I was up on there, and I had my two helpers. Now all three of us had, remember we just had one BAR? Yeah. Now we've got one apiece, and I've got three teams. We were, we were putting some steel on the target to the Chinese coming up that hill. Myself, I went through, I went through 800 rounds. 800 rounds, 20 rounds in a box magazine. Box magazine, got 20 rounds in it. Bam! Slam it up in there. Toot, toot, toot. And, and when, when it fires the last round, it drops out. Guy grabs it, puts another nut. <laughs> so they but... And, I, and the whole time I'm in Korea, that's the only time I really had a serious situation. Uh -huh. I mean, where I thought, these guys kill me in a heartbeat. They did. So you were scared? Yes. That's enough, enough I couldn't control my bowels on my bladder. <laughs> I mean, it was just, you know, it was, they were getting too damn close. So you were in the Battle of Old Baldy. Old Baldy, Okay, yes. got it. And it was uh, 200 yards from Porkchop Hill, which they made a movie about. They should have made a movie about Old Baldy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so now, now I'm going to Georgia Tech, okay? But before that, okay. 
So you were in Korea from 1950 to 53, and then you went back to Korea 2016. Yes. How about that? Was it? That was it. That was it. So now you are in a very unique position to tell young children yes. and students about Korea you saw 1950 and 2016. Describe in detail how different that was. I was. And I always started this way. I say when I left Korea and, and Seoul, the capital, there were three buildings standing. Three. Only three. Only three. I can name them. The uh, First National Bank of Korea. Mm -hmm the train station mm -hmm. and First National Bank train station and Joseon City Hotel. Hall. City, City Hall. Hall, okay. Those three were, were still virtually undamaged, virtually. But everything else uh, was, was leveled. And that was from not only uh, the Chinese or the North Koreans or the United Nations. But that's the way it was. And right. I, I start the class yeah. by explaining that. And 2016, what did you see? Oh, I felt like I was uh, uh, the skyline of uh, no, not, quite New, not quite New York City, uh, but a modern American city, such as St. Louis or such as Cincinnati or Atlanta, Georgia or Miami Beach, that type thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What did you think about it? I thought, I'm so glad, I'm so glad that I participated in helping these people recover from that. And I immediately thought of that first little village chieftain who said, all I want you to do is help me get the doo-doo out of the cave. <laughs> you know? So you was, were not able to find the doo-doo there in 2016, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I, it would have been a joy forever if I could have ever found my way back to that. But heck, I was on the other side of the, of the DMZ. Well, when you left Korea in 1953, did you ever imagine that Korea would become like this today? I did not. I, I, I did, it, was, it was too devastating. But somehow, somehow the, the people are so, so industrious, you know, and somebody, somehow, and I forget who the leader was, said the first thing we've got to do is get a steel producing mill. Mm -hmm. and, and once we get in the steel business, we can then start making ships. And they're probably the number one guys, people in the world now about those big ships. Uh, then he said we've got to make our own automobiles. And all it just started going. Mm -hmm. Just started going. So I was really anxious to get back. And of course my wife had no idea about Korea one way or the other. <laughs> Do you know the rank of South Korean economy now in the world? In the top 10, I yep. think, are pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. I'm can you, very can proud. you believe that? I'm, I'm very, yes, I'm, and I, I'm very proud that I had some small part and that I was there to see that and realize that in some small way, along with several hundred thousand other GIs, that we saved this republic, and it's there today. And I still worry about North Korea. I don't trust that guy on at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think he would, he'd, he'd use nuclear weapons if he thought he'd get away with it. So I'm glad we've stayed there, because think of it this way. We're still in Germany. We have been there since 1944, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I think it's, we've, we, we've benefited from that. But more so, we've benefited from what's taken place in South Korea. Right. And that's, so, my, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. But you know that in the school, we don't teach much about South Korea, the Korean War now, right? No, we don't. So how do you think that we can change that dynamics? How can we change so that they can teach more about Korea? I'd have to give that some serious thought as to how that, but I think it's going to have to start at the, at the top level mm -hmm. with, with the president, and it's got to start with, a, with a, the, the, the evening news, yep. the news show. The, the, 
But by doing something like what you've been doing, like a Tell America program, and now you are making a video yes. program. Yes, and, and, I, and the way I visualize this is now I'm going to walk into a high school and in my pocket is a thumb drive. And then that thumb drive is the whole banana. I mean, the, the, that PowerPoint presentation, voiceover, the whole schmear. And I think, I think that will do a, a lot to educate not only the high school kids, uh, but the children of today yep. are computer literate at when they're in the third or third or fourth grade. And I want, have, I want them to have access to that thumb drive. So you and I are going to work together to make that We're going program. to somehow make that thumb drive come yes. up. Yes. yes. Now, so far, we've only worked with one, one company, uh, and, then, and, and, they, and they saw the same presentation you saw today, mm -hmm. the same one. Mm. Uh, and they said, do you want to... You, what you want is a thumb drive that's the whole banana. Uh, that you, that because I described to them how it works in the high school now, mm. not how it worked four years ago, five years ago, when I was a one-man band, and I had my, my little projector, I had my laptop, and, and, they, and the high school had the screen, mm. right? Now the high school has the screen, and they have the laptop, and they have the projector, and all I've got to do is hand them the thumb drive. Yep. Okay? And the sergeant grabs it up, puts it in there, and says, General, you have the floor. And so I talk. But I, I, to, to, to get this out on a bigger scale, yep. I got one head and two hands, and, and there are not that many other people in the Korean War Veterans Association that really want to do this. You're really doing a good job, sir. Uh, I, I, so I, I, I praise you. They just don't want to do this. And mm. so. But I'm going to get there because I've, by one way or the other, yep. the, the, the Mark Carey's have come into my life. Yep. I remember recruiting him like it was yesterday. The Bill McLaughlin's have mm -hmm. come into my house, into my life. Uh, Roger Rubati has come into my life. Uh, and and the, my treasurer. Uh, in other words, I've, I'm putting together a really good team. Yes. Bo a board of directors. I, I, I keep it at nine and rotate the weak ones out and, and try two new ones and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that sort of thing. You are the leader. So, tell and me I'm, about... And I'm, besides that, and I'm in good health. Good. That's you know? very important. Yeah, it is. You are exceptional. Yeah. That's, uh, I, uh, well, so fine. let's go back to the Georgia Tech story. What All right. happened? Okay, what happened? so I get, uh, I, 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 uh, uh, after, after with, uh, uh, the, with the principal of Central High School, Mr. John C. Ott, Mr. Ott, bless uh, kind of saved my life. Uh, so in, two, two days later, mm -hmm. or three days later, I'd sometime Christmas is over, uh, I've been accepted, so I'm back on the Greyhound bus, and I'm en route from Charlotte, North Carolina, to Atlanta, Georgia, mm. which is where Georgia Tech is. I get off, uh, it's almost a, re a repeat. I get off the bus, I ask, can you tell me where Georgia Tech is? Mm. They said, yes, it's, it's on Spring Street. I said, where is Spring Street? And he, said, he, he just said this, he said, that's it right there. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, which direction should I walk? He said, that way. So it showed up, and and that's when they really kind of broke some bad news to me. They said, "Now you understand, you're only going to be here for one semester, and and our objective is to focus on college algebra, chemistry." Yes. Well, we're going to start you out this first two months in remedial math. I mean, you could have knocked me down. I hated that word, remedial math, my ass. Mm -hmm. I'm 20 years old, I'm a veteran of the Korean War, and I go into a remedial class, and not only that, it wasn't even on campus. I had to walk across North Avenue and go up to the third floor of the YMCA, where mm -hmm. those classes were being taught. And I was in there with a bunch of 17-year-olds. And I didn't like it. I mean, no. I, but I, you know, 
that Mr. Carmichael said, I know you don't like it. Mm -hmm. I know you're 20 years old. I, 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 you're a lot more mature than the freshmen that are taking that same class. Stick with it, because when you get out of here, we're going to pin our lieutenant bars on you, and you're going to have a degree from Georgia Tech, which is a renowned engineering school. Right. So when did you finish your degree? 1958. Mm. 1958. Oh. Pat bachelor's degree, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, but all the, all the time I'm at Georgia Tech, I'm in uniform. Mm -hmm. I'm in the ROTC program mm -hmm. because I want to be a second lieutenant, right? Yeah. So I'm doing that. And they're paying me $32 a month mm. to be in the ROTC program. <laughs> so did you get the GI Bill? Yes. Oh, I, I, I got that before I ever met the principal, John C. Ott. Mm -hmm. So I had that, yes, and uh, my mother had a, a, a much better job, uh, so uh, the family was uh, on a, a prosperous footing there. Uh, there, of course, everybody's my sister, my grandmother, my mother, everybody's deceased now. So, but the, it's the old family cemetery is still in Perry, Georgia, and and as they've passed away, that they're interned there, so. It's exactly one mile off of I-75. Mm -hmm. I can't drive past there, I don't stop and go by that cemetery just to pay my respects. What was the most difficult thing, if I ask you to pinpoint only one out of many during your service in Korea? What would you say? I'm gonna start with just saying what I, the most difficult thing in Korea was with unquestionably the cold. Oh. Um, I, I can remember many sessions just with the guys in the, you know, you, a platoon has 30, 30 soldiers mm. and one lieutenant and one platoon sergeant. Uh, and so there's a whole lot of uh, chit chat back and forth. And as winter was approaching, we were having some serious discussions about going over the hill. Mm. I mean, we were going to go AWOL. But then we changed our mind. Mm -hmm. That's, I look back on it now, now that I'm 87 years old, I look back and say, boy, we sure made a good decision. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, 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 <laughs> the MPs would have picked us up the next day. <laughs> so what would you say to the Korean people in, in regard to the 70th anniversary of the breakout of Korean War and what Korea now stands for? To the Korean people, get, just keep doing what you're doing. Keep building, keep, keep making products like the Kia automobile uh, so for the world to see. Uh, and the villages here, everybody loves that Kia, one called Soul. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little square back looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sure you know what that is. But anyhow, it's, it's very popular. And, and that's important. And let me think, too. Uh, you know, uh, when we went back, when we went back in 2016, first time for my wife, of course, and uh, uh, somehow the word got around amongst the, uh, the South Korean, the Republic of Korea's army, mm -hmm. that, hey, we've got a uh, a two-star general here that was once in the 7th Infantry Division. South Korea has a 7th Infantry Division. Somehow they got a picture of my golf cart which got 7th Infantry Division on the bumper. Mm. Okay? So they said, make, we're going to make sure our trip stops at the 7th Infantry Division. I see. And we did. The commanding general, this guy, he tried eat. He did everything he could to heap praise on us and let us know how welcome we were. Mm. And the fact that when the buses pulled up, he had the battalion band out there in white uniforms playing John Philip Sousa music. Mm. I mean, over and over and over. <laughs> Wonderful. Had a nice meal, got a briefing by his staff, and it was time to get back on the bus. And he came up to me and he said, General, I've got something I want to tell you. I said, what's that? 
He said, I'm Christian. Mm -hmm. And that, that touched me. That touched me. Uh, and he was so proud of it, you know, because quite frankly, I, I'd never given that a lot of thought. I'm Christian, mm -hmm. but I, I, I just assumed uh, that that was not the predominant re religion. I know better now. It is the dominant religion. Yep. And that is good as well, in mm -hmm. my opinion. So I'm just spilling my guts here now. I'm just <laughs> you're, mm -hmm. you're picking my brain. Mm -hmm. Okay? This is good? Yep. Any other story that you haven't told me yet? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it came to pass that now I'm a lieutenant, okay? So how did I get from second lieutenant to two stars? Yeah. Okay. How? Will Hill Tankersley. Again. Lieutenant, had lieutenant, remember Again. him? He's a regular army guy, right? Yeah. And he made sure he, when, when he learned that I'd gotten into Georgia Tech finally and, and I'd been commissioned a lieutenant, he saw it in the Army Times, he called me. And at that point, he ended up being a, a major general. He's passed away three or four years ago now, I'm sorry to say. Anyhow, he, said, he told me, he said, now I'm going to give you a trick that we all learn at West Point and you've never been to West Point. When you're a second lieutenant, you're going to be a platoon leader. Now, what do you want to be after you've been a platoon leader? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, uh, a company commander. Right. Now, you're going to be a successful company commander. Now, what do you want to be? I said, uh, uh, battalion commander. He said, that's right. But you can't get from company commander to battalion commander unless you serve on somebody's staff. And you always want to be the operations officer. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be the guy uh, that's in the, the company clerk counting the beans. Or, or, or you don't want to be the one that's the laundry guy. You want to be operations mm -hmm. guy. Now, once you've done that, you always look in the Army Times. If there's a battalion that's changing command, and they're looking for a new battalion commander. It will be published in the Army Times. And as soon as you see that, call them. I don't care where it is. It's if it's in Alaska, call them. Tell them you want to command that battalion. Mm -hmm. And so you know what? That's what I did. Mm -hmm. And they would, generally speaking, have three or four majors who want to be a lieutenant colonels. In some cases, it's a lieutenant colonel who's been working in the office he wants to be a, have a command, that kind of thing. So, put the papers in, and the first time, didn't do too good. Second time, got closer. Third time, got it. So now I'm a battalion commander of the 926 Engineer Battalion, Fort Benning, Georgia. Hot wow. damn. So that's how that worked. So I just, until I got to the end, and there were no more engineer units, so... I then took a, a, a course with the Signal Corps mm -hmm. and became qualified as a signal officer. And that's why I ended my career as the commanding general of the 335th Signal Command, Fort McPherson, Georgia. Mm -hmm. How about that? So amazing. Now my story concluded. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That's a long way from the guy with the duffel bag on the bus. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> that's a story. But I think back on that. That's the story of legend. You yeah. Know? yeah, and I think back on the little guy that said, if you could just help me get the poop out of the cave. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that was so big in his mind and his life. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that I could cure that in one day. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't, I didn't have to tell him, go get me uh, 50 pieces of uh, 8 by 12 trestrated lumber and uh, call me and I'll come back. I said... We've got, every, we got all that stuff. We've got all that stuff. And, and what we're supposed to do with it is to help the economy, help the Korean people. The war is over, or it's coming, coming close to it being over. Now, I, I know how to put in a septic tank. I know how to do that. And that's only because I came from a small community. That's how it grows, from very small thing uh, that you were able thing to. There. Yes. But there was Uncle Booty, and there was Uncle Lewis, my mother's two brothers, mm -hmm. 
and, and they were typical farmers. Farmers, you know, learn to do most anything. They really do. I learned in the Army. If you, if you really want to give a soldier that can do most anything, pick a farmer, mm. a Kansas farmer, a Texas farmer. And that's my story. All oh, this, right. has been, this has been fun. I wasted too much of your time. No, no, no. God, you realize how they are talking it's continually? It's been uh, just uh, one and a half hours. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other story you want to leave? <laughs> no? Well, I've got stories about some of my soldiers and some experiences. But I'll, sh I'll share those uh, over lunch or something like that. Okay. All right, so thank you so much again for your leadership in this chapter, and we need to have a really good president for next uh, KWBA national chapter. And I hope that you can run for it and uh, you can still lead the whole nation, okay? I'm you have a run great for, spirit and you know how to do those things. I know how to do those. Yep. So, uh, and I'm gonna run for it, yes. Great.